On the edge of the great Kalahari Desert in northern Botswana lie some of the world's most remote and beautiful wilderness areas. Places like the Chobe and Moremi National Parks, where short summers are wet and productive, but winters are long, dry and brutal. The summer is ending now and the days begin to shorten as the dry season approaches. No more rain will fall for the next nine months, and every sunset will bring to a close another day of withering, desiccating heat, and herald a coming night of biting cold. For the animals of this vast network of plains and forests, this is the cruelest time of year, when vigilance and adaptability will determine who makes it through Africa's most savage season. Every day is served up as a test of resilience for each different animal, as water holes dry up and food becomes more and more scarce. Only the toughest individuals of the most resilient species will make it to the other side of this harsh test. Most animals will move away to seek sustenance and water near the mighty rivers of the north. Zebra and buffalo begin to leave as resources dwindle and the hot breath of the dry season begins to wither all before it. Other animals follow, but along the edges of the plain in the transition area between grassland and forest, known as the ecotone, one of Africa's most successful survivors remains to tough it out. The graceful and resourceful Impala. The beauty and seeming frailty of these timid antelopes belies an ability to survive not only the adverse elements, but also a constant and savage onslaught from every predator that shares their world. In March, at the beginning of the dry season, the impala population is gathered in mixed herds, and the shorter day length sets off a switch in the hormonal activity of the males. They begin to respond to the ageless pressure of nature that drives species to procreate and become increasingly intolerant of one another in herds and at gathering places. Aggression is on the increase and behaviors such as ground horning indicate a readiness among the mature males to do battle with each other over territories and females. The shorter days mean longer, more dangerous nights for the impala. This is when they are at their most vulnerable to the legion of predators that hunt in the dark of the night. But as the moon becomes full early in the year, it triggers another passage of savagery in the tension-filled life of the impala herd the yearly ritual known as the rut. The rut is the annual competition for territory and mating rights among the prime males in the population. The mature males are in peak condition at the start of the rut. Hormonal activity has strengthened neck muscles and thickened skin for protection against horn wounds when fighting. Fights at first are limited to bouts of light sparring and horn twisting. This allows males to size each other up without serious damage. But soon, along the edges of the plains and around the water holes, fierce battles begin to break out.
These are normally quickly settled, and the vanquished male surrenders as gracefully as possible. But sometimes the safety line of ritualized combat is crossed, and injury results. Unlike deer, whose antlers are seasonal, antelopes have permanent horns, and once broken, they will never grow back. Males who lose a horn at best will never have an opportunity of breeding, but often this spells a worse fate. Horns broken off at the base can cause an infection in the soft tissue of the head, and a slow and painful demise usually results. In particularly violent exchanges, a male can lose both horns, and then has no way of defending himself against painful stab wounds. Sometimes, even both horns cannot protect the unwary combatant from a cruel twist of fate. This male, ambushed from behind while engaged in combat, had a horn driven deep into his body cavity. A wound such as this is the end of the line, and death is not far off. The impala is the primary provider for higher levels of the food chain in southern Africa. The intact carcass of the wounded male provides an opportunity for scavengers to feast, rather than pick at the leftovers of other predators. This is just the beginning of the violent month of the rut, when the process of natural selection can be seen in action as weaker males are removed from the gene pool. For the surviving rams, the serious business of breeding goes on. Once a hierarchy has been established, the most dominant male stakes out the prime territory and begins to display ownership. He patrols his boundaries at a steady, measured gait, walking in a tall, proud posture, rather like a gunfighter of old. When an intruder is detected, he stops, draws himself up, and stares steadily at whoever is foolish enough to challenge him. Interloping males are chased until they are forced off the territory, usually right into the next dominant male's line of fire. The rams at the top of the hierarchy hold sway over the prime territories with the best resources such as food and the right mixture of cover and open land. This in turn attracts the most female herds. Now all the male has to do is keep them there. And that's where the real hard work begins. First, he weeds out the remaining immature rams who are chased away from their mothers for the first time. All the displaced youngsters and non-breeding males satisfy their herding instincts by forming bachelor groups that live on the fringes of society. They need the security of numbers for predator detection, but antagonism remains high. For the youngsters, this is like a training camp where they learn sparring skills for future serious bouts. The most dominant males give off a strong scent from glands in their foreheads. Weaker males sniffing this scent detect the higher hormonal levels and back down from challenges, a mechanism that regulates aggression. Back in the breeding herd, the male is now using three times as much energy as the bachelors. He has to keep his females from leaving his turf. The closer they stay to the center of his territory, the calmer he remains. 
but as soon as they wander too close to the border, they must be herded back. He chases down the most receptive females and as a prelude to mating, indicates his intentions by ritualized behaviors such as following and tongue flicking. In between mating, he has his boundaries to keep and marks his territory by rubbing a secretion from his forehead glands on surrounding vegetation. Roaring with neck stretched low is also a territorial advertisement. The dominant male of the herd is now being stretched to his limits. Not only must he mate as often as he can and repel sneak raids from amorous males in the surrounding bachelor herds, but he has to herd his females all day long. All of this activity begins to wear on the ram, and through the mating season, he can lose 30% of his body weight. He also loses the edge that is the impala's only line between survival and disaster. And at this time of year, the predators begin to target the noisy and conspicuous males. A female cheetah with almost full-grown cubs has part of her territory in the impala herds area. Attracted by the sounds of the rutting rams, she moves towards the edge of the plains under the watchful eye of some giraffe. While she uses vantage points on the edge of the plains to spot potential prey, her cubs follow along. At 16 months, they are old enough to become effective hunters and are enthusiastic learners, mimicking all of mother's moves to learn her skills. She uses a dead tree to detect the herd's position and quickly moves off to begin the stalk. The cart still has to learn that climbing is not something that cheetahs are particularly good at. Approaching the impala, the cheetah's eye is honed to detect the slightest sign of fatigue and weakness in any member of the herd. An opportunity at an exhausted and preoccupied male is difficult to resist. The cheetah catches the male totally by surprise. Weakened by constant physical exertion over the last month, he is much slower off the mark than his harem, who escape and stand a short distance off. Cheetah rely on the speed of the chase to exhaust their prey, which they then quickly suffocate by cutting off air with a throat bite. A noisy kill out in the open like this is likely to draw unwanted attention. Many other predators are alert to opportunities at this time of the year and the local pirates are no exception. A hyena clan has a den nearby with hungry young pups and they are constantly on the lookout for easy meals. The bleats of the ram and the alarm snorts of the herd are exactly the signs that the hyenas wait for and they are quick to react. All three cheetah 
are no match for the brute strength of a hyena. They cannot afford the slightest injury. A mere broken toe would throw off their fine tuning and affect hunting success. So the family grudgingly backs down. The cheetah move off to watch from a safe distance as more hyenas begin arriving on the scene. It's better to hunt again than to risk a brawl with nature's most ruthless gang members. The cheetah's loss, however, is a necessary gain for the hyena clan. Back at a den away from the plains, three sets of pups await the arrival of their parents. Each female in the clan gives birth to two black pups, who gradually become lighter and spotted after two months. There is serious rivalry amongst hyena siblings. What appears to be playful tussling is actually an establishment of dominance between and within each pair of pups. Even as infants, hyenas can turn into deadly killers. Sometimes, while still in the den, the stronger pup will kill its brother or sister to reduce competition for mother's milk. The dry season is now moving into its third month and things are getting tougher for the impala and many other species of the plains. Water holes and rivers are drying up rapidly. The days are baking hot and temperatures plummet at night. Winter is the beginning of an easy time for the predators as animals slowly weaken from lack of nutrition. In the impala herds, the mating season is over and most of the reproductive females are pregnant. Impalas have a gestation period of seven months, but the females can extend this if the first rains are late. Unfortunately for them, this puts them under the most nutritional demand through the toughest time of the year. It's no longer the males who are under attack, but the pregnant females that are most vulnerable. And they now come under the closest scrutiny from predators. This lioness would normally not be stalking impala in the heat of the day, but because the females are pregnant and slower, her chances of catching one are good. A careful approach Freezing each time the herd looks her way, gets her within striking distance. Within a few months, it would have been worth an attempt. But for now, the Impala are probably still too fast, and she lets them go. One of the keys to the Impala's success during the savage season is the ability to switch feeding habits. Most other antelope that share habitat with the impalas are specialized in only one form of foraging. The wildebeest, for example, feeds on grasses of a certain height and quality. During the dry months, when that kind of food is no longer available and water is scarce, they move in large numbers away from the degrading grasslands. 
kudu also come under feeding pressure in the dry season, although they can survive without having to migrate. They are specialized leaf eaters, or browsers, and feed on bushes and trees on the edge of the plains. Impala, however, can take advantage of both food sources and switch easily from grazing to browsing. They have the ability to eat fallen leaves when outcompeted by other browsers and can even resort to digging for underground shoots in dried up water holes. It is this flexibility of behavior and the ability to take advantage of every nutritional opportunity that makes the Impala one of Africa's toughest competitors. Deep into the dry months, some species of acacia tree come into full bloom, attracting the attention of troops of baboons. They climb to the top of the trees and feed on the nutritious shoots and nectar-filled flowers. As the troop greedily picks at the blooms, they drop more than they eat. Impalas know this and once again are on hand to take advantage. They move in under the trees and help themselves to a great protein boost during this lean time. Along with the baboons, there is another hugely successful generalist living in the Impala's realm, who's not only able to change feeding behavior, but can change and manipulate the very environment in which it lives. Elephants feed along the ecotone during the dry months, reaching for the foliage they need to fuel their six-ton bodies. They too will remain with the impalas and baboons, and the three species' lives will stay closely linked until the coming of the rains. These giants have a fascinating method of harvesting a food source, directly available to no other species. The pods of the camel thorn tree, Acacia albida. With their great strength and size, they could easily tear limbs and pods from the tree or simply push the tree over. Instead, they carefully shake the tree, causing the pods to drop to the ground. They then use that ultimate feeding tool, the trunk, to deftly gather the rich morsels in a delicate grasp and pop them into a cavernous mouth. This behavior is remarkable in many ways. It benefits the elephant, who not only gets a rich meal, but seems to understand that by leaving the tree standing, there's a guarantee of other harvests of pods for years to come. It also benefits other inhabitants of the ecotone, and once again, the first to move in are the impala. Their teeth and jaws are not at all suited to chewing and swallowing pods, but again, their adaptability affords them a protein-rich meal.
Others also arrive to take part in the feast. The elephant and impala dislodge seeds, blooms and insects in their feeding and birds like red-billed quileas and tiny blue waxbills take advantage. During these harsh times, resourcefulness becomes the key to survival. And again, it's the ability to change feeding behavior that helps individuals make it. This is displayed by an experienced male baboon who's had to survive other harsh winters. It seems he's learned that the river, before it dries up completely, holds some underwater secrets. Crocodiles keep baboons from going anywhere near the water under normal circumstances. But these are desperate times. It's hard to understand how a behavior so foreign to this animal could have evolved. But with remarkable skill, he feels for the underground bulb of a water lily and removes it to safety. This truly amazing new behavior seems to leave the wise old fella totally unmoved. With great dexterity, he peels and eats the succulent shoots before tearing into the food-packed storage organ of the plant. Some animals have the ability to easily relocate to more permanent waterways during the dry months. A resident fish eagle could fly to the nearest permanent river in less than a day. He's a highly specialized hunter of fish and amphibians with huge talons adapted to the grasping and holding of slippery, wriggling prey. With the drying of the waterways, his continued presence here is somewhat of a mystery. The answer is, once again, in the ability to make a slight change in behavior. An alternative source of food has become available. Thousands of turtle doves fly in from miles around to drink at the last remaining water. All the fish eagle must do is adjust from prey that swims to prey that flies. magnificent predator so linked with the waterways of Africa will have a winter of plenty with no competition in this strange dry land. Not only is predation on the increase but the impalas are having a tougher time at the water holes. Predators often take up residence in the dry season to ambush prey. If a pride of lions decide to take a siesta at the water's edge, the impala will have to wait. The dry winds of winter and the furnace-like days of early spring conspire to drain the earth of all its precious moisture. At water holes in the area, the concentrations of elephants leave devastated vegetation for miles around. The impalas have to move long distances from feeding grounds to water holes, exposing themselves to attack. When they arrive, they are usually again forced to wait, as they are outcompeted by the bigger and stronger animal. 
it seems things could not get tougher for the resident impala herds. But they do. Impala make up more than half of the diet of wild dogs. And with uncanny timing, this pack is moving into the area to find a den for the arrival of new pups. The dogs usually set up home in a den abandoned by previous tenants, such as porcupines or warthogs. And the first order of business is to expand and modify the tunnels. Once the breeding female has given birth to the pups underground, the pack is anchored to the area for at least three weeks. They set up territory in the area by scent marking at established marking spots around the edge of the plains. Although they hunt primarily in daylight, they often set off to hunt before dawn. And while they're in the area, they work mostly along the ecotone in the territory of the Impala. This is Africa's most efficient social predator. Once they have selected a target and stalked close enough, they seldom miss their intended quarry. Again, it is an exhausted male impala that is caught. With a method of killing that appears cruel, dogs are much maligned as vicious, unfeeling brutes. But they kill quickly and share the spoils evenly among themselves. All the while at the water holes, the situation becomes more and more serious. As thunderstorms threaten to break the desperate grip of the dry season, bull elephants line up patiently in a well-established hierarchy, waiting their turn to drink. This is an organized rotation of dominant individuals and small groups of allies, sometimes standing 50 deep, waiting hours for their turn the meager, muddy pools. The female herds with their babies are much more anxious about traveling across open areas and drinking at the water holes. This year, the herds are under extra stress. The distances they have to travel daily between feeding grounds and water has been made even greater by a huge fire that has swept through the northern part of Botswana. They are tired and edgy, and there is an undercurrent of thinly suppressed panic in the nervous herds. Quite often, two or three breeding groups move in together, causing confusion at the waterhole. The old matriarchs and mothers keep their young under careful surveillance, never letting them get more than a trunk length away. They have carried their babies in pregnancy for nearly two years, and the bond between mother and calf is so powerful that it will last their entire lives. A young bull calf, barely two months old, arrives with the group. His back is freshly caked with mud where his mother has bathed him to prevent sunburn. The herd spends time enjoying a drink and a splash before setting off again in the late afternoon. The walk back to the feeding grounds will be challenging as the hot winds of October blow up a dust storm that will rage through the night.
Early the next morning, it appears something has gone terribly wrong in the night. The young calf with the muddy back has somehow become separated from his herd in the dust and darkness, and now he finds himself utterly and desperately alone. Elephants with their deep social bonds are known to adopt stranded orphans. If he can attach himself to other elephants or find his own herd very soon, he stands a good chance of survival. The little calf is as helpless and confused as a human infant would be without his mother. It's obvious that he can smell her and the herd in their dung surrounding the pools, and he spends time sniffing at the familiar, comforting smells. He also picks up the scent of elephants on the trees where they have rubbed themselves after mud bathing. In his confused and panicked state, he leans up against the tree as if it were his mother's leg, trying vainly to draw some comforting, reassuring gesture from an unyielding, inanimate object. After his first hours alone, help arrives in the form of a few huge elephant bulls. His desperation for contact is obvious as he approaches the adults to greet them. With little more than a brief inspection, the bulls mysteriously ignore the little waif as they make their way to the waterhole. The calf struggles along in their wake, calling frantically for attention. The calf is still totally dependent on milk. He can't even drink water for himself, and as the temperature steadily rises into the hundreds, he becomes more and more thirsty. Without the bulk of his mother to protect him from the sun, dehydration begins to set in. Desperately thirsty, and now even more confused, he attempts to suckle from the bulls at the waterhole. At first, the adults ignore the pitiful advances of the youngster, but as he becomes more persistent, their indifference turns to anger. In the water, he is repeatedly kicked by one of the bulls. The blows from such a huge animal to the soft young head obviously stun and damage him. Even after such violent treatment, the urge to be close is too powerful, and he struggles after the adults. Like an abused child, he knows nothing else to do but follow and keep trying to make a friend. It's midday now and fiercely hot. The temperature in the sun 
is over 120 degrees, and the bulls have retreated to the sparse shade of some nearby trees. The orphan continues desperately to seek attention and comfort, but is continually rejected. His utter confusion and lack of understanding of what is happening to him is obvious. He spends the hottest part of the day dejectedly circling the herd in the baking sun. As the bulls start to leave in the afternoon, the tiny stray tries to follow and the rejections begin to get more violent. This aggressive behavior is highly unusual, considering the gentle and tender nature of elephant social life. The calf retires to a small grove of trees where he stands shivering and twitching in what appears to be a state of complete nervous collapse. The resilience of this little beast, however, is remarkable, and his will to live drives him back out into the open. He once again attempts to suckle, this time on a tree, before heading back to the water hole. Having collapsed at the edge, he barely manages to drag himself into the mud. At last it seems there is real hope when a herd of cows with a young calf his age suddenly arrives to drink. As he persists in getting close to the herd's own calf, the reaction of the females is shocking. This would be the ideal group to adopt the stray. With young calves of their own, the females are lactating and their overpowering maternal instinct should be stimulated by the calf. But instead, he is once again violently rejected. With remarkable tenacity, he keeps following. But now, the matriarch has had enough and this time actually tries to kill the bewildered baby. It's obvious that something is dramatically wrong. Is this violent reaction an indication of the stress the elephants are under? Can the females simply not afford the energy to adopt the youngster because this year's meager resources are barely enough to raise their own offspring? Is there something physically wrong with the baby that the other animals can sense and want to avoid?
Whatever the answer, time is running out now. As the sun sets, the final act in this desperate tragedy of a day begins to unfold. Under the very eyes of bulls who would normally savagely defend a calf, the executioners of the night move in. Although his death is violent and brutal, it is merciful at the same time. He will not have to endure another minute of the loneliness, bewilderment and pain that was this terrible day. Dawn at the waterhole shows no evidence of the previous day's events. Life in Africa goes on with a ceaseless, uninterrupted rhythm. Every event has its place and fits seamlessly into the flow of days and nights. It's the beginning of November now. The Impalas do not have long to hold on until the first rains. The pregnant females are in the most dangerous two weeks of their lives. Sunken flesh around pelvic bones and protruding ribs are the only indicators of their poor condition. They are alert because predators know that the time is never better to catch these normally elusive antelope. Still the most dangerous time for them is the trip back to the plains. The female cheetah has spent the whole winter preying on impala and with her cubs almost fully grown is having to hunt every day. It is a good time to be a cheetah. Through the season, the cheetahs have lost over 70% of their kills to the hyena. So the female has changed her behavior. Few of her kills are far from cover now. Once she has caught this pregnant impala, she drags it, still alive, under some bushes. The cubs are learning to kill but the noise may attract the hyenas again, so she swiftly dispatches it. Every day now is critical. The rains are almost here. Female impalas have the incredible ability to delay giving birth for up to two weeks. They then produce all the lambs in the herd within a few days of each other, providing safety in numbers. Invariably, though, females who mated first in the season can't hold on, and there are early arrivals. 
The hunters of the plains know that these youngsters represent an easy meal. With pups of their own to feed, the wild dogs are targeting the babies. Once the herd is panicked, the babies are on their own. It's just a matter of running them down. This dog displays the skill of a seasoned hunter by keeping the baby running in circles, cutting off its escape at every turn. probably kill most of the early babies, but the herd is almost out of danger. Localized storms are now releasing rain only miles away, and the big thunderstorms, bringing the season's first heavy downpours, are starting to roll in. Rain very quickly brings a close to the seemingly incessant days of heat, dust, and death. The land is rejuvenated, springing to new life, and the impala give birth to a whole new generation. They will have four short months of plenty to build their strength before the beginning of the next savage season.